Given the recent political news, are you starting to get concerned about the election results and how it might affect your hard-earned dollars? Well, stay tuned to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. Welcome to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm David Scranton, here with Sarah Samuels. And today, we're going to get just a little political. Eh, not really. Eh, but talk about the election results and, and some of the things that happened just over the last two weeks that really put the results even that much more up in the air and may just have you concerned about how it affects the economy and how it affects the stock market. Yeah. Dave, it's great to be here with you, of course, and with all of our listeners. And I think it's fair to say that a, a lot of people were maybe a little bit shaken up even after the presidential debate, uh, just seeing kind of the way, you know, President Biden was was handling the questions and 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 it might make people a little bit nervous, especially when it comes to investing in their portfolios. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's questionable because now you're thinking, OK, if they keep President Biden in there, uh, then it looks like Donald Trump has a much higher chance of winning the election at this stage, especially with some of the Supreme Court rulings giving him, you know, immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if so, if you, if you don't like President Trump, you know, ex-President Trump, that's a big concern, right? Uh, but but even then, oh, well, what if then they replace President Biden on the docket? Who's going to be there? Who's the vice president going to be? And, you know, you're you're sitting here four months away from the election. So, yeah. Sarah, I think it's normal for our listeners to worry about, OK, how's that going to affect the markets? How's yeah. that going to affect us? But, you know, in general, I want to calm everybody down and I want everybody to realize that you shouldn't be making any major changes in your investments. Um, so, you know, I could tease it along. And I could just get, let, let's stay tuned till the third, fourth uh, part of the show here. But I don't want to do that to you. That'd be cruel. It's too important. So, you know, the, the, the bottom line answer is you shouldn't be making any major adjustments right now in your portfolio uh, unless you need to make major adjustments because of your stage of life. Yep. And I think unlike the uh, the mainstream media and a lot of times the media, their goal really is to maybe hype everything up, to really get more eyeballs on their show. That That's mm -hmm. really their goal. Uh, but our goal here with this show is really to educate people. And, and really, people might be surprised to learn why they really shouldn't uh, let it affect the way that they're that they invest mm -hmm. and really that they should uh, they should focus on where they are in life and their their stage that's of right. life. That's right. And that's always good advice. And yeah. right now, if anything, I'd be worried about in terms of a black swan event would really be geopolitical risk. Yeah. It's if other countries look at us, and, and I saw uh, something that came out right after the debate, and it was on social media, and it was from China. And it kind of implied that, you know, who's the winner of the debate? We were. Mm. And that's a scary part. So, uh, but that's that's in general, it's a geopolitical thing. That's something that you, you know, you could bury your head and put your money on the mattress and you can't really protect yourself from something that's as major as us getting involved in a major war. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's get into our first Ask Dave question. So we have a question from Clark in Tennessee. He says, Dave, I've always heard that Republican administrations are typically better for the economy. Is this actually true? Well, you know, that used to be in the past. And today we really haven't seen that, right? If you think about it, uh, when the elder President Bush was in office I guess from 88 to 92, we actually had a recession during that time. Uh, economy was doing pretty well during the Clinton administration. Had some struggles again during the Bush administration. Did well during the Obama administration. And then did well, for the most part, during Trump and now during Biden. I mean, think about it. The Federal Reserve right now has been doing everything to try to slow the economy down. And they still can't get it down to the 2% inflation rate. So that tells you it's a pretty strong economy. So now, now am I saying that I'm flipping and saying... Uh, Democratic administrations are better for the economy than Republican administrations? No, not at all. But what I am saying is that it's, for the most part, politically irrelevant. Uh, the only time you might have an issue is if one party took over really all the branches of government, right? Yeah. If one party took over the courts and took over the Senate and took over the House and the White House, then I could see where you could have somewhat of an issue because, let's face it, you know, Republicans tend to be a little bit more pro-business, which is generally good for the economy, good for, uh, good for the financial markets, the stock market, right? And Democrats tend to be a little less pro-business. But again, they've got to really own most, if not all, parts of the government. And that's why our forefathers were so smart in designing a system like we have today is that, you know, I would tell you that that old adage about 
Republican administrations being you know, better for business in the market and Democratic administrations being worse, that whole adage for the most part has gone away. Well, Clark, thank you so much for sending in your Ask Dave question. And if any of our listeners have a question, maybe something that you've heard and you're wondering if it's true, uh, please send us an email to askdave at retirementincomesource.com and you may hear your question answered on a future show. You're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it is all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton. And if you are feeling a little nervous about the way uh, that the country is going right now, if maybe you're a little worried about the election in November, uh, we're here to really kind of put your fears at rest and hopefully make you feel a little bit better and help you understand why politics really shouldn't be affecting the way that you're investing or affecting your decision making. Mm So, Dave, if we're saying politics really shouldn't affect you, what should be affecting your decision making? Well, it should be affecting your decision making is where you are in your life and what your goals are. And that should be 80% of every decision easily. easily. Yeah. So if you have a lump sum goal uh, that you will have a certain amount of money that's allocated toward, let's say, college education for children or grandchildren. And I know it's not lump sum, that's four lump sums, or at least hopefully four. With some kids, it's five lump sums. It could right? be yeah, six could even. Be, yeah. could be six, that's right. <laughs> but hopefully it's four lump sums. I consider that a lump sum goal. Or if you want to buy a home or a vacation home, that's a lump sum goal. So there, there are things, an RV, lump sum goal. But, you know, for that, you've got to really adjust your risk tolerance based upon how close you are to that goal. It's generally considered in the financial world between stocks and bonds that the lower volatility point is about two-thirds bonds one-third stocks. So the idea is when you're further away, you could be mostly stocks. As you get closer to the, to the goal, you start integrating more bonds and have fewer stocks, but you never flip 100% to bonds. That's the general rule. But Sarah, it also depends upon how important that goal is to you. Right. Yeah. If you don't mind postponing that goal for a few years, maybe you could stay a little more aggressive for longer. And if you get lucky, you have even more money And if you become unlucky, you just postpone the goal for a few years if you're okay. Yep. And there are some goals that you, that people probably are open to postponing, maybe buying that vacation home. Uh, But when it comes to paying for something like college, that's not, you know, you can't always postpone that. That's right. Then you have to, you know, essentially be able to take a home equity line of credit to pay for it, wait for the markets to come back and then, and then pay it off. Uh, But retirement's different. You know, retirement is different from all other goals. And that's how we talk about it so much in the show, Sarah, as you know, because it's about generating income. It's really the goal that's not lump sum. It's about generating enough renewable resource so you can live off your income and not have to touch your principal, at least until you're in your mid-80s, right? Because right. you don't want to worry about running out of money. And that's the goal, really, that, that you have enough money that you're able to generate income. But of course, there are some people, Dave, that, that are in that boat where maybe they have to uh, go a little, little longer, right? Whether they have to maybe take a little bit more, um, maybe do something a little bit more riskier, perhaps. They have to stay in the market a little bit longer to try to make more money because they don't have enough to actually retire. And that's a good point. So for those folks, they need to think about, gee, do I want to retire on a lesser lifestyle and yeah. just pull back? Some people, for some people, the answer is yes. Uh, for others, it's more of a no. Uh, and in fact, I have a client who did that. Uh, I could think of one person individually who said, I don't care, I'll pull back, have a lesser lifestyle, I want to retire today. And we we're able to do that for her because she made the sacrifice and it is what it is. Uh, but for a lot of people, you might say, well, no, I don't want to sub- sub- really subject myself to that. So I'm willing to work longer. Well, that's okay. Then you might have to roll the dice longer and take more risk. So again, it really depends even in retirement about your personal goals, your desires, and your priorities. And But but coming up, we're going to explore what if you have saved enough money? Where What if you're close enough to having enough to retire? Then what should you be thinking about leading up to retirement? And then how should the recent political atmosphere affect it or not affect it? I'm David Scranton here with Sarah Samuels, and you're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. Welcome back to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton, and we are talking about why you shouldn't let what's going on in politics affect the way that you invest. So we talked a little bit about your goals for retirement and why you really should focus on your goals uh, when it comes to the way you invest and why if you have a lump sum goal, uh, you can might want to kick the risk down as it gets closer. Uh, if you're behind in retirement, there's only a few options, really. You might have to retire later than you'd want to, or you may even 
have to retire at a lower level of life than you would prefer to. But Dave, what happens uh, for those that that really have enough money? They they feel like you know they've won the game of life. They've got enough money to retire. Explain that a little bit more. Those are the people that really need to start making that crucial transition we always yep. talk about on the show 10 or even 15 years before retirement where they they go from being total return focused regardless of where it comes from right yeah. in, in the i or the g the interest and dividends or the growth yeah. to an income first growth second approach those are really the people that have scored enough points right they have to play defense now yeah in fact we you know we just did a show uh, about income about how you can you know if you get a certain amount of income from your portfolio while you're still working you could know with pretty good certainty how if you reinvest that income, how much it's going to increase by between now and the time you want to retire with pretty good certainty. So it, it, if you have enough points to win the game of life, mm -hmm. you have enough to retire, then you really got to start making that transition sooner. And even 15 years is not really too early to make mm -hmm. the transition. If you're five years out and you have enough to retire, well, the good news is the markets are still pretty strong. So you can make that transition today. Now, if you had gotten, if you push your luck too long, you might yeah. get stuck in a market downturn, and it might be too late. Yeah, and you really don't want to push your luck, right? That's really pushing your luck is for the folks that unfortunately maybe haven't saved enough, or, or maybe they haven't put enough away. Uh, if you have already amassed the points, it, it's good to play defense. It's it's good to transition and to start generating income. Plus, a lot of people forget about reinvesting those dividends, mm -hmm. right? All that money, you're still working 15 years out. You don't need that money, so you can reinvest it and, and it grow your portfolio. It doesn't mean you give up growth potential altogether. Yeah. You can still get growth. It's just an income first, growth second philosophy. And as much as I say that, you know, you shouldn't let politics drive your decisions. I know there's some of you listening here today that are saying, well, gosh, you know, if Donald Trump gets back in the White House, it's going to ruin our country. And there's others that are worried about, oh, my goodness, if you know president biden gets back in with his current state of mind after the last debate that's a disaster or if kamala harris gets in well if you're still feeling that way but you have saved enough to retire regardless of your political affiliation bottom line is it's a great chance it's a great reason to make that transition so even i tell you don't invest based upon politics what i'm really saying is that you should be making that transition anyways so if your nervousness about the election results is the catalyst that'll get me to convince you to make that change to an income first growth second approach. Well, then go ahead and do that because you should be doing it anyway, regardless of any election concerns. Yep. Well, here's uh, an election concern. In fact, from one of our listeners, we have Ed from Virginia. He sent us an email. He said, Pres President Biden is forgiving student loans, but you can't make that debt disappear. So isn't this bad for the economy? Yeah. Absolutely. What's his name again? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Ed. We, Ed. Ed. So, Ed, it, of course, it's bad. More debt is can be problematic, right? And and I agree that forgiving the student loans, I, I don't know what the reason was. A lot of people think it was just to get more votes. I don't know. Um, or maybe it's some idealistic thought. Uh, but I know that I had to pay my student loans. And, Ed, you probably had to, had to pay yours. But the real principle is that debt of all types is puts a little bit of a strain on the government, puts handcuffs on the government. It's like it's like you, you know, if you if you are working somewhere and you've got a big mortgage and you've got car payments and you have everything else, and now you hate your boss and you want to just quit and look for another job, you may not be able to do it because that debt creates a stranglehold, which helps you lose your financial flexibility. And the same is true with us. We're going on close to a trillion dollars a year now of debt service, just interest on our national debt, a trillion a year. And that's such a big number now that it lowers our financial flexibility as a country. So yes, it hurts us if we were to end up in a war and, 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 and have to spend money on that. It hurts us for pretty much anything else that we want to do, ultimately could have upward pressure on tax brackets. But Ed, what I want to share with you though, is it's is like our, our first caller, it's, you know, President Biden and the Democrats don't have a ticket on debt. Remember, we first got into national debt for the first time, I believe it was during the FDR administration. Before that, we'd take on debt when we're in a recession, we'd pay it off in the good times, kind of like a credit card. But starting with FDR and some of those programs, we never got out of debt again. And it's gone up with every administration, whether Democrats, whether Republicans, even recently, right? Uh, yes, President Biden did a lot to push, to, to increase the debt, uh, I agree. But also during the Trump administration, there was a lot of spending and a lot of debt increase then, too. So, again, yeah. just let's understand that it's not a Democrat or Republican thing. It's really a politician problem because it's not their money. They're voting our money. 
And that, Ed, is the real issue. Yep. Ed, thank you so much for sending in your Ask Dave question. And if any of our listeners have a question that you would like to send us and maybe hear it on a future show, all you have to do is send us an email to askdave at retirementincomesource.com. You're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton, and we are talking about how you might be feeling. A lot of our listeners might be feeling a little nervous. They might be worried about where the country is going, uh, no, no matter their political affiliation, especially after the recent presidential debate. And a lot of people might be wanting to make rash decisions because when you're scared, sometimes people want to act. It gives them that illusion of control. Um, but really, you know, that's it's not the time to focus on who's in power, uh, who's the president. It's really time to focus on your goals and where you are at in your cycle of life. But Dave, you know, speaking of political affiliation, uh, let's hear it. Are, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Uh Believe it or not, I'm actually a registered independent. Oh, Dave, that's a cop-out answer. <laughs> You're on the fence. Well, it, it, you know, it, it, it is because, again, no one party has a license to all the solutions and no mm -hmm. one party has a license to all the problems. Yeah. And I've registered as an independent because, you know, I, I, I could see benefits in either party. Yeah. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, the problem with that, though, is uh, we, we've never really had an independent uh, candidate get elected, at yeah. least to a major right. spot. So. It's it's difficult. Yeah, I'm 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 in the middle because I see benefits to both sides and I see problems with both sides. And it amazes me why they can't see problems within their own party or refuse to acknowledge problems in, in their own party. Yeah. Yeah, it really gets to be a, a black and white kind of thing where you're either on this side or that side and yeah. no matter what you've got to side with whomever your team is, right? And the one thing I do see is that there seems to be some empathy for what happened in the last debate. Oh, you know, yeah. a lot of people you know, even the, the, the liberal media is coming out and saying, you know, this is terrible. They're, they're not trying to cover it up. Um, yeah. And the, you know, the, the conservative media actually has some empathy for yeah. uh, President Biden, what's happening. And there have even been comments about, you know, where is the first lady in all this to pull her husband aside and to say, hey, yeah. Joe, you got to you got to quit. You got to quit while you're ahead here. This isn't good. Uh, because you know, he wouldn't, he's not going to, it seems obvious by watching what we saw the other night that he can't survive a four year term. And frankly, it might the stress will significantly shorten his life expectancy. So there comes a time where, you know, you got to have that empathy and then say, okay, well now what's the best for the country? The Democrats got to figure out what they think is best in, and, and then let the citizens vote. Right, right. And I think a, a lot of people have empathy for him. Um, you know, just seeing it, of course, you you know, you feel almost sorry for someone, but it's also understandable where people might have concerns as he is the president of the United States currently. And as of right now, he's up for reelection. He's going to be the, the person the Democrats run. So people are feeling, you know, feeling a little nervous. Yeah. And that the media really plays it up. I think that's the other big, big point, too. No, no, they do. And I get that. I get the nervousness. Yeah. But you just have to remember, no matter what your beliefs are, you know, the world isn't going to end in four years uh, with any candidate, no matter who it is. Right. Um, it's really hard because the checks and balances, you know, we have we have in our government. So I, I think it's so important then for, you know, our retirement income source listeners yeah. for you to just sit back and say, OK, maybe we have more uncertainty now than ever. But that's a good reason to make sure that you're invested for your life stage. Uh, whether it's a lump sum goal, you're taking the appropriate amount of risk for that lump sum goal based on how far out that is. And if your goal is retirement, then to have enough uh, to take the right approach for that. Again, whether you're behind the eight ball or whether you have enough money to win the game of life, what you can do. And in fact, uh, one of the things coming up I want to talk about a little more on the show, Sarah, is more about uh, some of those stra income strategies that people yeah. should be paying attention to. Uh, in, in this in this world, whether they're if they have enough points to win the game in retirement, but whether they're uh, you know whether they're if, if they're still concerned how that might affect their investment choices in the income first growth second world. Absolutely. All right. We'll talk about that. I am Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton, and you are listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. 
Welcome back to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton. And so far today, we've talked a lot about why you shouldn't let politics necessarily affect the way that you're investing or affect your choices, especially if you're scared or you're nervous about what's going on right now. But we talked about what you really should focus on as you're nearing retirement. And that's really looking at your goals for retirement, especially if you have a lump sum goal, if you would like to maybe pay for college for your your grandkids, maybe Maybe you want to buy a new home, maybe an RV and travel the world. Those are all lump sum goals. And if you haven't saved enough, uh, then you might need to, you know, kick those goals a little bit down the way. Um, in addition to that, we've talked about, you know, what happens if you haven't saved enough money, enough uh, money to retire. If you might need to potentially retire at a, at a lower lifestyle, if you want to retire now, or if you're able to actually retire later. And one of the most important things, Dave, is if you have actually gained enough points to, you know, win the game of life. Mm -hmm. You're able to retire now. We talked a lot about why it's maybe beneficial to make that transition to the income first, grow second approach, even 15 years out from your retirement mm -hmm. date. Especially if in spite of what I say, if you are yeah. concerned about the markets, uh, you are concerned about the economy. And there's a lot of people out there today that are more centrist like I am that yeah. believe that you know they, they're not in love with either candidate right now. That's a, yeah. that's a, that's yeah, a real that's big issue. Yeah, that's the other thing, right. You know, and, uh, and I've heard all kinds of, you know, crazy theories. I heard about uh, somebody said, uh, you know, that uh, put Kamala Harris on the ticket and then put uh, Barack Obama as the uh, vice president candidate. Now, could you and do that constitutionally? He think, could be sure, vice president. Sure. Yeah. I think he's too smart to take the job. But, but here's the thing. But, so if he's <laughs> vice president, what if the president, something happens, could he ascend to be president again? Well, I understand, yes, he can because okay. he can only, can only get elected two times. Ah, oh, it's the election. But okay. if he gets put in there, you know, even as a second in command under President Biden, yeah. he can then take the role. But again, I think he's, he's too smart for that and doesn't want to do it. He's got enough other interests but yeah, if you're so let's get back to retirement, right? Mm -hmm. If you have enough points to win the game, you have enough money, then you know, what are the things you should be getting into? Well, you can get into these high dividend common stocks we always talk about, where you can get over a four percent average dividend still being in stocks, so you still have some growth potential. If you're on the more conservative side, you can get into bonds, get into preferreds. And if you're in the middle, you might want to sprinkle on to bonds and preferreds some business development companies, some BDCs, some REITs. You know, these things I'm talking about, Sarah, are the things that are really encompassing the universe of options, right? Yeah. You only have nine or 10 different income generating options, really. And there are certainly different types of stocks and different types of bonds and offshoots. Um, but the biggest thing is that philosophically, people have to make that shift. They've got to yeah. make the shift from being total return focused, regardless of whether it's coming from the G or the I, the growth of the income, to an income first growth second philosophy. Dave, you mentioned that uh, people might, they're listening to the show, but they're saying, you know what, Dave, I don't care what you say. I'm still a little bit worried. And we have an email actually from Patty in Alabama. Uh, she says, I'm about 12 years out from retirement. And yes, I am very worried about this election. I do want to make the transition to the income first approach, but I'm worried that my fear is actually going to affect what I choose uh, when it comes to income strategies. So this is, this is a great question, Patty. Okay, Patty. Well, you know, it, if you really are concerned, you know, you need to sleep at night. So if you're really concerned, you're probably going to go to the more conservative things when you make that transition to an income first, growth second approach. You're probably going to look at bonds because bonds are contractual, right? You might want to go a little longer term because remember, a bond pays a contractual interest payment and really needs to default, i.e. go bankrupt before they stop paying it. So as long as you pick good companies, um, that, that's a more conservative role. Uh, right a step above that in terms of risk is probably preferreds, right? Preferreds are technically a class of stock patty, but they pay a fixed dividend. So although companies don't necessarily have to go bankrupt to stop the dividends, they treat preferreds much like bonds, uh, and they pay a little higher rate than bonds do. So if you're really concerned, that's where you want to focus your energies. If you you if you look at it and say, you know, gee, I don't think my concerns are valid. I think it's, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being nervous Nelly about this. Then you could start to layer on a little bit of, let's say, BDC, business development company. A business development company is basically the fund of a, uh, it's a fund that lends money, takes investors' money and lends it to medium-sized companies, right? So a bond is a loan and a BDC is investing in a portfolio of loans. The only difference is BDCs are for medium-sized corporations, right? 
If you're a small corporation, you go to the local bank to borrow money. You're a big corporation, you go issue bonds on Wall Street. Where, where do you get money from if you need to borrow money? You're medium-sized. Well, that's where BDCs come in, business development companies. Uh, another thing is possibly real estate investment trusts. You know, stock of a company that owns a rental property. If you don't think things are going to get too bad, well, then that rental income comes through to you in the form of a dividend. Again, a little riskier than a bond or preferred, but it's an option. And, of course, the last one is the high dividend common stock, uh, which, of course, common stocks can cut dividends, as can REITs and BDCs. So, you, you know, depending upon how concerned you truly are still, after our, even after a show today about the markets, that'll judge where in that income first world do you wait most of your money versus maybe where do you just sprinkle a couple dollars? Patty, I hope that helps. Yep. And Patty, thank you so much for sending in your Ask Dave email. And if any of our listeners have a question that you would like to ask Dave, all you have to do is send us an email to ask Dave at retirementincomesource.com and you may hear your question answered on a future show. Thanks for listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it is all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton, and today's show has been all about why you shouldn't let what's going on in the political realm affect the way that you make decisions and why you should really focus on where you are in life, your life cycle, what you want out of retirement, especially if it's for a lump sum goal, if you just really want to focus on generating income in retirement. And Dave, I think that question from Patty was was great because a lot of times you can't, you can give people all of the facts, but they still feel a little bit nervous. And that nervousness might make them, uh, they're going to want to make decisions maybe based mm -hmm. off that. They're going to trend to be a little bit more conservative in their choices. That's right. And that's why even, you know, when we manage money for our advisors that are around, our around the country, our income specialists, yeah. you know, the core is typically bonds and preferreds. And then each advisor in talking with their clients can determine how much of the other things to add on, right? How yeah. much you want to add on in terms of uh, BDCs, business yeah. development companies, how much you want to add on in terms of REITs or even international bond exchange traded funds. We didn't even talk about those yeah. to Patty. Yeah. And of course, to add on how much in high dividend stocks based upon a person's goals. Yeah. And, you know, it depends upon what your concerns are. Now, if you're in the camp, for example, that, uh, you know, you think that this work from home thing is going to stay and there's problems with office properties, then you might want to be careful of certain types of real estate investment trusts yeah. because that could be a big concern, right? Um, so you might want to stay away from those and invest yeah. in some that are different. I don't personally have that concern overall. I think New York City's got some troubles, but there's some, you know, some, generally speaking, office REITs, I think, are, are doing okay. Yeah. And look at just our office here. Look, look at the parking lot. I mean, we get people here. There's very few places. We had a, a right of first refusal. The landlord act for more space. The, ac yeah. the, the landlord accidentally rented it to somebody else and had a scramble to find a place to relocate them so we can exercise our, our ROFO, as they call it, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm not worried about that. Yeah. Um, but what if people are, especially what if people are worried with the election, it's going to affect the stock market, for example? You know, what, what should they be looking at in that case? Well, then they want to stay away from the common stock, even the high dividend common stock, or maybe do a, le a lower amount of it because the market's been on a pretty good tear. And regardless of who gets in, doesn't, I mean, it, it's, it's, it could have a pullback. You know, we had a little pullback in the, uh, um, you know, we had a little pullback when interest rates went up in, you know, just 2022, but that could be predicted when interest rates go up, the all, value of all financial assets goes down. So that was a Fed manipulated pullback. And as soon as rates got close to where they were peaking, uh, the market came roaring back again, yeah. just like it did during the pandemic. It came roaring back within just a few weeks. So, so again, if you're really concerned, then that's what you might want to do. But you know, Sarah, it's interesting. There's no reason that you can't get out of the common stock market if you're ready to make the transition to the I, make the transition in less things that have less volatility. Yeah. And then depending upon how the election goes, maybe get back in right. you and can always, some common stocks. Right. You can always make, uh, do, make some decisions after the election if you want to. But you also have to realize then you could very well be getting in at a, you could be getting in a lower price. You could be getting in a higher price. Yeah. And that's the problem with trying to market time is that, you know, when you try to time the market, let's face it, the smartest people on Wall Street can't successfully time the market much more than 50% of the time. So if that's what you're trying to do, it's just too good of a chance that you get out and then you get back in at a higher price. You end up overpaying for the same investment that you have now. Yeah. And you don't overpay because remember the secret is buy low and sell high.
Yep. And income strategies can help you do just that. And we'll explain some more, some income strategies you should be looking at, whether you're concerned or you're not concerned about who's going to be elected president. We're going to talk about that. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton, and you're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. Welcome back to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm David Scranton here with Sarah Samuels. And today we're talking about the debates and concerns that you might have about the election results coming up in November and what changes you may or may not want to make with your money leading up to that. And if you're just joining us, you know, I don't want to bury the lead here, but so far we've talked about the fact that in most cases you shouldn't make any major changes based upon election results. Uh, no one party has a license on all the good ideas or the bad ideas. And frankly, some of the old adages about how Democratic versus Republican administrations affect the economy, affect the stock market, really have not held true for several decades now. So what should the major drivers be? Well, again, if you have a lump sum goal, the major driver and how much risk you're taking should be how close you are to that lump sum goal. Uh, culminating with uh, what's considered by Wall Street to be the more conservative portfolio, two-thirds bonds, and maybe one-third stocks. Now, how about retirement? Well, if you're behind the eight ball in retirement, you have two choices, right? You might want to roll the dice, take more risk for longer uh, because it's the only shot you have, or you might say, no, I want to retire at a certain time at a lesser lifestyle and just get comfortable with that. But what if you have enough money? Or I should say, on a pro rata basis, you have enough money. Well, then, if you do have enough money to retire on that pro rata basis, then you definitely want to start making that transition to an income first growth mind, growth second mindset. And that's regardless of what you think about the election, whether you're concerned about it or not, bottom line is to start making that transition now. Yeah. And Dave, I think when you when you get started, when you want to make that transition, part of the process is really figuring out uh, your I need goals versus your I want goals in retirement. You know, you're right. We talked about that in previous shows. We haven't talked about that so far. Yeah. And it's true. You know, some people will say, OK, what do I need in mm -hmm. retirement to live the same lifestyle I have today? So let's say they're making one hundred and fifty thousand as a family. And they figure between what they're saving, putting in 401ks and everything else, they can live the same lifestyle in retirement at 100000 That's their I need goal. Yep. And they'll take the more conservative things like bonds and preferreds, like I told Pat uh, just recently in our previous Patty, segment, yep. right? And he said, you know, you might want to do more conservative things. Some people take their I need goal and they want it funded with bonds and preferreds, yep. things that are more contractual. Then let's say that, okay, I can live 100 on 100,000 in my same lifestyle. But when I think about all the things I want to do in retirement with all that extra time, I really want 140. Right. That's how much you're going to need in order to go on the vacations or, you know, and, and to enjoy your money in retirement. That's right. Some people say, well, the extra 40,000, the difference between the I need and the I want goal, I'm willing to fund that through things that have more risks. I'm willing to fund that through the BDCs, the business development companies. I'm willing to fund that through the real estate investment trust. I'm willing to fund that through high dividend common stocks. Because if some dividends get cut, I'm not cutting into the bone. I at least... Right can live the same lifestyle that I have today. You could still pay your bills. That's right. Exactly. So it really depends. If you have so much money saved, you're so far ahead, maybe you could do contractual things for everything. But I find that for most people, they don't want to do contractual things for everything. They want to dabble a little bit in some of these other items I mentioned and yeah. take a little bit of risk even in retirement. Yep. Well, let's get to our next Ask Dave question. We have this question from James in New York. He says, Dave, you haven't mentioned annuities at all. So where do they fit in? Uh, you're right, James. I haven't. We've talked about annuities on previous shows. Yeah. We've actually done a show uh, on annuities and uh, just not too long ago. So it depends what you're talking about here for annuities, James. So there are four different basic types of annuities, right? The first is, uh, let's just say, is, is an immediate annuity. It's basically a pension. It's where you put your money into uh, in a contract with an insurance company. It's irrevocable. You can never get that money back because you've exchanged it for a guaranteed lifetime income stream, like a pension. If you live to be 110, they're going to pay you every single year into retirement. But if you die after a year or two, the insurance company keeps the rest of the money. Those are good for people who are behind the eight ball in retirement, where they're behind the eight ball. They don't want to extend their retirement. They want maximum income from whatever it is they have. And they're willing to give up access to the money for it. That's where immediate annuities can come in. But James, the reality is, I find that only 3% of annuities out there that people have are immediate annuities. Why? Because when you start talking about making it 
uh, a decision that's, that's irrevocable, that you can never change, you can never access your principal, you can never increase or decrease your, your, your income, people need to think long and hard. The second type of annuity is a variable annuity. It's where you're basically in securities, you're in the financial markets taking risk. Uh, now, for those, most of those are designed for younger people, people who want to be heavily in the stock market, who are willing to, you know, want tax deferral. So they say, I'm willing to tie my money up to 59 and a half and get tax deferral and be aggressive in the financial markets. Um, but again, they're for people who want to take more risk. If you're retired or close to retirement, James, and, and I assume you might be as you're calling in and writing in, listening here, um, then you're talking about fixed or fixed indexed annuities, which are really the two that I think are most appropriate for a majority of people that are retired or within 10 or 15 years of retirement. And especially if you're really concerned about risk and even corporate bonds and preferreds give you a little pucker factor, well, then that's where annuities come in because they have even less risk of default than preferreds or bonds. James, I hope that helps. James, thank you so much for sending in your Ask Dave email. And if any of our listeners or YouTube viewers have a question that you want to ask Dave, all you have to do is send us an email to askdave at retirementincomesource.com. You're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton. And we hope that today's show has helped you feel a little bit more at ease. If you're one of our listeners who has been worried about what's going on in the political world, worrying how it might affect your investments, especially if you're nearing retirement. So we talked about the things you really should be focusing on, right? Especially where you are in life. Are you five to 10 years out from retirement? Are you closer than that? Maybe you want to retire in five years or so and really doing an assessment of where you are when it comes to your money. Do you have enough to retire now? If so, maybe transition a little earlier, go to that income first approach and reinvest the money versus if maybe you need to uh, you need to stay working a little bit longer, maybe retire a bit later. And, mm -hmm. and Dave, we also talked about a little bit a few moments ago, the I need and the I want goals. And you mentioned a lot of times people want to fund the I need goals. Those are the bills that have to get paid with the more conservative investments. Mm -hmm. And the I want goals, maybe they take a little bit more risk with those. That's right. And I mentioned bonds and preferreds. Yes. And then, of course, James came in with the question about annuities. Annuities. A left which, field. <laughs> which, is where, which is where fixed and indexed annuities, fixed and fixed indexed annuities sometimes come in yeah. for contractual uh be able to get contractual income or at least guarantee you against loss, yeah. right? Because remember, you know, for those of you who are really unfamiliar, annuities are basically insurance company based savings instruments. And insurance companies are regulated in, in is pretty much as, as highly as heavily as banks are. Yeah. So when when you're looking at let's say a fixed or fixed indexed annuity, you're looking at something that's backed by the full faith and credit of that insurance company. As when you're in a bank CD, it's backed by the full faith and credit of a bank. Yeah. Now, you know you don't have the FDIC insured. That's for banks, but it's also important for people to understand that insurance companies have each state has its own backup guarantee fund for insurance companies. And frankly, that existed before the FDIC ever existed. So yeah. the FDIC was actually modeled after these 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 guarantee funds for the insurance companies themselves and sarah think about it like our 401k right you're young you're probably in stock funds in the 401k right yep, yep. trying to but, growth take advantage of it right but we have a fixed income choice there yes. that pays i think it's four point something percent fixed do you know where that money is ultimately invested where invested in the insurance company mm, okay so insurance company sense. basically something called a GIC, a guaranteed investment contract and in fact most fixed accounts in 401ks are backed by insurance companies. That's that's where they go because they're too big oftentimes for banks to want them. Yeah. The insurance companies can handle it. And uh, so when you think of a fixed or fixed indexed annuity, you think of essentially a GIC, but it's a GIC for an individual. Mm, um, that's right. And that's why the yeah. state guarantee fund protections are there. Ironically, we don't even have the state guarantee fund projections uh, or protections on the, the fixed account in the 401k hmm. because that's institutional. Yeah. So people are, you know, who want to be really conservative, that's where that comes in. Yeah. But, you know, for most people, you've got some that you want insured, like in CDs or maybe insurance companies like we talked about. Some that you want contractual but not insured, like bonds or preferreds. And that's some that you want in things that have a little bit more risk but have a little upside potential. This is where the business development companies come in, the BDCs, uh, that 
you know, can pay into the double digits in terms of interest and dividends. Of course, you're taking more risk. We try to stay out of that. We try to stay with the more conservative ones. Yeah. You get into the REITs. You get into high dividend stocks. So again, for most people, it's not all one thing or another. It's a yeah. blend of most of the above. Yep. And when you work with an income specialist, you don't have to worry about who's going to, you know, be the next president or whether Republicans or the Democrats are going to take control of Congress uh, because you're really working and building a plan off what you know to be true instead of just what you're hoping to be true. That's correct. hundred percent. I agree. Yep. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, and we hope you did, you can always listen to it again and listen to all of our past episodes by visiting our website, retirementincomesourceradio.com. And most important, we hope that you're here with us next week. Same time, same station. I'm David Scranton here at Sarah Samuels, and you're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income.